Professor Hogan Boom sets out to understand more about the brain's capacity to respond to change, to learn, and to heal. Modern life, the school run, work holes, inflation, remember your lines. Scientists are carrying out pioneering Sorry, research. The whole thing. Okay, the whole thing. The whole thing. Three okay. Times. Our brain never evolved for any of this, and yet, here we are getting on with it as best as we can. And it's all thanks to our brain's incredible capacity to adapt, to learn, to grow. I'm on a journey to understand the miraculous plasticity of the human brain. The brain will even change its structure. The core, the architecture of the brain can change. This is neuroplasticity. Once thought to be limited to youth, we now know it's a constant force in shaping who we are. Your mind can change the very uh, substrates of its own operations. Helping us to learn. Adaptability is one of the most remarkable aspects of human intelligence. And I think plasticity is the mechanism behind it. And to heal. Well, neuroplasticity actually is at the core of a neuro rehabilitation. An active field of study that's helping us to understand how we became us. As things move forward, we're going to see more and more how much our motor ability actually is tied to the way we think and feel. And I want to know whether there's anything we can do to harness or boost neuroplasticity in our daily lives. On this journey, I'm going to give you three hacks to help strengthen crucial connections and keep our minds younger in the process. As a science journalist, I've always been fascinated by the workings of the mind. And today, I've come to Royal Holloway, University of London, to scan my brain before embarking on a six-week brain-altering course. Just taking a moment to settle into this posture. This is Thorsten Barnhofer, professor of clinical psychology at Surrey University. He's currently running a study on the effects of mindfulness in managing stress and difficult emotions. He's also been looking into how mindfulness changes the actual structure of the brain itself, showing signs of this neuroplastic rewiring even after just a few weeks. And what makes mindfulness especially impactful is that by reducing stress, it allows even more plasticity to take place. But will it work on my brain? We're about to enter the fMRI scanner to see what my brain looks like from the inside. I'm getting my brain scan before and after a period of doing just 30 minutes of meditation a day. Hi, Melissa, how are you? Yeah, good. So all you need to do is just relax, try to keep still and look at the fixation cross. Okay. And it'll last for about 15 minutes. Right, so that's quite a long time. But what exactly is neuroplasticity? Plasticity is the ability of the brain to change based on stimuli that is given. These are the basis of learning and memory. It's a really dynamic process that involves the whole brain. And something else really fascinating that we've only learned recently, the brain will even change its structure. Our brain is uh, constructed from a billion of neurons and uh, when neurons fire together they it's called wire together they become stronger and the the connection between them is become stronger these can change and shift a lot more in the early years of life than they can as we get older of course they're still changeable later on and that's really what we call brain plasticity the ability of the brain to keep reorganizing itself um, throughout the lifespan uh, that affects the functional networks uh, in the brain and a functional change will be what areas of the brain are connected to what areas. There's also a structural part of plasticity, mainly changes in how the areas are organized in the brain, whether areas that are more dense or less dense. Well, neuroplasticity actually is the mechanism through which the, the, the brain repairs itself. And now there are many ways to harness and boost plasticity in patients with neurological disorders. So neuroplasticity, the brain responding to change, actually takes place all the time. But we have the power to influence this to some extent too. And there's good reason to want to boost it. 
increasing studies suggest it can play a role in delaying degenerative diseases like dementia. It can also help us to rewire the brain after psychological trauma, meaning that trauma itself is not permanent. Back in the scanner, I'm shown a series of numbers and asked to recall the preceding number to test my working memory. There will be other processes underneath the working memory process that get interesting. Um, so mind wandering will happen and if mind wandering happens or it comes close to it, there will be a certain uh, brain system that becomes more active. Mind wandering is something that of course might be helpful uh, in many ways. Uh, it might help us with creativity, but it's also something that can go awry. And this is where repetitive thinking comes in, where ruminative thinking comes in, where worry comes in. And uh, those are the factors which increase stress. Stress hormones, for example, are cortisol, it will go up. And if levels of cortisol remain high, um, that can actually become toxic uh, for your brain, for regions of your brain which are very plastic. This shows that stress, amongst many other things, is a direct inhibitor of neuroplasticity. So as part of my first brain hack, I'm training myself to manage stress through mindfulness. Over the following six weeks, I'm going to spend time learning to be as aware as possible to the present moment and see what impact this has on my brain. So what mindfulness does is uh, it can buffer stress. You become aware of challenges. Those more ruminative responses, uh, a tendency to worry. We can't take away the pain of uh, any stressful situation, but uh, there's a sense of us being able to choose what the next step is. So the very first step uh, within this is to say, yes, uh, let's come back uh, from this complexity to something that is relatively simple and stay with that. So finding this point where the breath is most vivid for you and then following the breath, moving into the body and out of the body. And I feel calmer already. <laughs> but my mind was one, it's the idea to not let your mind wander. Um, so I was thinking about like, oh, I need to send that email, I need to do this. And I was like, okay, no, how interesting, yes. about breathing. Uh, that's, that's a really interesting observation. Uh, so, so first of all, we, we can feel that actually as I'm doing this, I come to it with the intention to stay with the breath, uh, to keep my attention on the breath. And actually what happens, uh, this is just what the mind does, it will wander off. That tells you about the working of the mind. That's something which is relevant. So we can simply go and say, ah, that's what it is. We come back, go back to the breath, go back to the breath. So we do two things at the same time, if you like. We're, we're strengthening our muscle for attention, for staying on the breath. And we're cultivating our capacity to come back, to be more flexible in our attention. We're also gaining insight into the working of the mind because we're realizing, ah, oh, this has come up. I've known about the supposed amazing benefits of meditation for at least a decade. Have I incorporated that into my life? Uh, no, not at all. One reason for that is I don't often find myself sitting on a peaceful mountainscape in Italy. My actual life looks more like this. One minute, one minute. Okay, yeah. Okay, you get the idea. And I'm sure it's the same for many of us. That's why I'm especially grateful for Thorsten explaining what's actually happening in my brain. Most consistent findings we see is in a region called uh, the hippocampus, which is the um, main center for regulating the cortisol axis of the brain. It's also involved in regulating emotions and it plays an important role for memory. 
are, so quite central functions. And then you see changes in other regions, uh, like the insula, for example, which is involved in whatever we do when we become aware of what we're doing. Bodily awareness is one aspect uh, of this. We see uh, changes in regions that are involved in regulating our attention, so frontal cortex regions, and regions that help us in our decision-making the anterior cingulate, for example. We'll get to the results of these later to see if my brain actually changed its structure, but I want to understand if there are any other hacks I can do concurrently that might also boost plasticity. So aerobic exercise is a very, very powerful uh, way to enhance plasticity. This brings us to hack two, move. Physical activity facilitates the procedure of plasticity so if you combine physical activity with some cognitive tasks to improve some skills that you are interested in, you probably will be able to do this in an enhanced way, in a better way. Our physical health and our mental health are absolutely tangled up together to create our quality of life. So we know the two things are tied, um, but cognitively they're also tied. And this is a throwback to the evolutionary story as well. So for example, we know that the bit of our brain that is responsible for speech is highly overlapping with the bit of the brain that does your motor dexterity. The reason for this is that we actually think that speech evolved from motor actions in our hands, probably a gestural system first. But what's interesting is that if you do um, dexterity practice with your fingers, you can improve your verbalization. And vice versa, if you do vocal practice, it will improve your dexterity. And we're here today at the Birkbeck Baby Lab. Um, and tell me what pioneering work you're looking to do now with like really young babies, actually. So we're super excited because we're just launching uh, this new motor cognition uh, project called Baby Grow. The study will be monitoring babies' development in their first 18 months with these smart, optimized baby grows and see how these track with cognitive development later on. One of the aims is to eventually be able to spot signs of cognitive disorders before they become apparent, so that interventions can be applied when the child's brain is especially plastic. Your brain is changing now, my brain is changing now, but in children it changes in a much higher pace and there's more plasticity and it sort of allows children to have a different brain basically every moment. And the way that their bodies move can tell us a lot about the way the brain is developing. There have been lots of studies that show that babies who have typical motor development tend to go on to have typical social and communication abilities. But then babies who might have early motor differences, that's more associated with potential diagnoses uh, for social and communication um, abilities later on in their life, maybe by four or five years old, but we don't really know why. That's, that's so fascinating. So essentially there's a link between how the body moves and how the brain develops. Can you tell me a bit more about that? This is exactly what, what we think. One of the special things about this project is that we're looking at how motor development influences cognitive development. And this is quite different from traditional psychology because we tend to look at cognition as its own thing. Natural selection and evolution doesn't build new brain components for us just because we're humans. We are building off of these old ones and by having a, a wider view of what cognition is and where it came from, it can help us to understand how babies develop now as modern humans. These insights bring a whole new perspective on the old adage, healthy body, healthy mind. You have just to exercise at least 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes, okay. Yeah, I think four, uh, four or five times a week, uh, 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 that will keep your brain healthy. But even more surprisingly, what we find is that they're forming more, uh, not just motor skills, but learning about cognitive tasks, learning how to navigate or learn music or a new language changes even these kind of hardcore connections of the brain that we used to think they were fixed. 
It's difficult. Oh, sorry. Dong. La pelle. Boom. And this is the third hack, learn. Surprisingly, even rhythm has a big impact on how we learn. Not just my questionable tambourine playing, but the rhythm of the brain. So I went to the mecca of learning, Cambridge University, to find out more. So the brain has its own rhythms. Uh, and sometimes we, we can think about it like we have our own rhythm, right? Um, this is what we call individual variability. And in neuroscience, we now have techniques uh, to be able to measure this individual variability. Now, if we can uh, engage the brain uh, by presenting information at its own rhythm, what we see is that the brain will learn better and faster. This is brand new research, right? Yeah. Can you talk me through how that experiment works? It's quite low tech, actually. Um, so we use a very non-invasive way of measuring the brain rhythms, and that's with an uh, EEG. And uh, we ask volunteers uh, to look at some information, engage with it, uh, do a little bit of a difficult task, for example, maybe decide if they see a specific object uh, in a very cluttered background. And that's, that's quite hard, and we can make it harder. <laughs> and then we see how the brain tries to solve this problem and, and what rhythms it engages in to solve this problem. Now, once we know an individual's brain rhythm, we can start engaging the brain in this rhythm, and we do it actually in a very simple way by presenting a flickering light. And actually what we see is that in specific rhythms, when you present a flickering light at that rhythm of the brain, the brain locks into that. And, that, and then when it processes new information, the processing of that information is facilitated and people learn better the material, the information we presented. Think about that for a second. Something as simple as light flickering to my brain's rhythm could actually make me learn new information better. And this groundbreaking research could very well pave the foundation for future learning solutions where digital lessons are presented in sync with an individual's own brain rhythms, boosting plasticity and enhancing their ability to learn. Okay, but as exciting as this research is for the future, I promised you hacks for right now. And here it's beautifully simple. Mix it up. Variation gives our brain novelty to learn, to grow and constantly forge new neural connections. So for example, when a baby starts to walk, um, they learn to walk on different surfaces. Uh, they don't learn how to walk on concrete or on grass. Uh, they learn some general principle and they adapt their movement. And I think we can learn from this as well in what kind of environments we should put adults in. We're now doing a study where we are trying to see what the best way to train adults to adapt to different gravities. Um, and I think what we're starting to see is that more variability experience in different gravities and not just one gravity allows us to adapt better. So we can really learn some rules and not facts about adaptation. So I need to go somewhere else than just my local park, but like change direction and... I, I would say it's better, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, the more situations you're um, confronted with, then it, it's easier for you to, um, you know, adapt to a completely new situation. It sounds like what you're saying is that we have a lot to learn from how children experience the world. And how, how can we better implement that? I think variability is one aspect. Another aspect is a relatively low penalty for error. For example, when a child learns a language, um, if they're doing a mistake, no one, you know, yell at them. How's your Italian professor? Terrible. Yeah? Can't speak any Italian. Should we, should we learn some Italian now? Sure. Yeah? All right. Go. What, what, I mean, what do you know? Some I basic? literally don't know anything. Huh? No, I've never done Italian. Ciao. Ciao's good. Okay, it's a good start. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Although I also speak Dutch, it's learning anything new intensely that will build connections and grow my brain. When I learn, I mean, I'm learning Russian now, and uh, every mistake that I'm doing, even internally, um, when I, I do a mistake, I have a really high penalty for error, and then that sort of reduces my ability to adapt or to learn some foundational skills. 
uh, children are just trying stuff. And uh, once they don't have high penalty for error, they keep trying a lot of things. And that is allowing them to adapt this interplay between plasticity and environment. Come si fa? Come si fa? Come. Come si fa? Come si fa? Children don't care. And this is what's nice about it. I think it helps them to learn. They just don't care. Basically, embrace being bad, especially when we're creating or learning new things. To a cent of Grammy? Practice and regularly exposing ourselves to situations where we're learning new skills all helps the brain to continue to adapt and grow and even helps stave off brain diseases. But it's not just preventative. The same idea comes into play when patients are recovering from serious brain injuries. Professor Angelo Quartaroni works at a centre where he witnesses plasticity in action every day. Even in the worst conditions, the brain tries to repair itself in some way. Of course, uh, with new rehabilitation, we can accelerate the recovery in patients. We apply different techniques of rehabilitation, robotics, virtual realities, or other sort of uh, rehabilitation approaches and using neuromodulation technique which can empower the process of neuroplasticity in these patients. I'm talking about transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation. Those are techniques which are currently used to boost up plasticity. This patient has lost power in her right limbs and Angela's team are using two key ways to boost plasticity and help her regain mobility. The robot and game she's playing help by employing many of the tactics we've seen so far. It's repetitive, variable and intensive, inducing plastic changes in the affected neural networks. But importantly, it's rewarding, which also helps strengthen these connections. Then there's the transcranial direct current stimulation device. That's the electric cap she's wearing, by the way, which provides a low current across the affected brain area. While this current is too low to trigger the neurons into firing, it does mean that when they do fire, even weak signals are amplified, helping to make stronger connections. This electricity is boosting the plasticity already being forged by the robot and games training. So essentially you're harnessing the brain's natural ability to change, so you're giving it a bit of a, a helping hand. Exactly. So you have a, a double heat. That's amazing. And you can see that in the brain, like when you take a, a scan, you can, see, you can see this change happen? Yeah, you can use techniques such as uh, MRI or also electroencephalography. Uh, you can evaluate connectivity in brain circuits at baseline and after all these procedures, and you can pick up how the, the brain rewire itself. Right, so I've been learning to meditate for six long weeks. So I'm curious to find out if anything's actually happened in my brain. We'll see. <laughs> After another brain scan, I went to Surrey University to find out. This is very exciting to see my brain on the screen. That's your brain, yes. Do you see any results in my brain? Yes, of course. We, we see changes uh, in the brain. It's alive. Uh, it always changes. I'm alive. That's, that's a good sign. <laughs> that's a good sign. And we have some interesting uh, uh, changes uh, that align with what we see in the literature. I'm a sample size of only one, of course. Yes, exactly. So we need to be cautious for all those who are scientifically minded. Uh, they wouldn't forgive us. So what have you found? We looked at the amygdala, um, that's in light blue, one of each in each hemisphere, and they are very important for emotional processing. And we see change in that region, particularly... You do see change? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. The right uh, amygdala uh, is reduced in um, volume, and that's what you would expect as a stress uh, reduction effect. Uh, so it gets bigger the more stressed we are. Um, it's uh, increased in people suffering from depression or anxiety disorders. And with mindfulness training, we see that reducing in volume and there's a hint of that yeah. in, in your data. And I wasn't very stressed to begin with, but even so, we, we see a tiny decrease, which is, I think that's quite exciting. Exactly, yeah. But that wasn't the only change he saw. He also found changes in my posterior cingulate cortex a region involved in controlling mind-wandering and rumination. 
what was interesting to us was that um, we see an increase in the posterior uh, region of this. What's and that? Uh, yes, in, in the darker uh, blue. It's part of a wider distributed network in the brain, which is uh, referred to as the default mode uh, network. The system comes online when our mind wanders. And of course, that's something which is very central to, to meditation. And we have seen in previous studies uh, changes in this region. And uh, that's exactly uh, what we find in your data also, uh, a small change in that uh, direction. Did it increase in size or decrease? Uh, it increased in size, which should be an indication of an increased control. So literally, just by being mindful, I managed to increase a, a, a part of my brain that prevents my mind wandering too much. Plasticity means that there, there's constant flux, so we would imagine that consistent input is needed. So it sounds like I need to continue meditating and come back and see you in a year and then we'll see some really significant things. We would recommend, yes. <laughs> it's amazing to think that after only six weeks there was a visible change in my brain. And that makes sense because towards the end of it I was feeling a lot calmer. But will I continue meditating into the future? <laughs> mm, I'd love to say yes.